In this screencast, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to do Punnett squares. Now, the Punnett square is incorrectly written on my lecture. I can see it's P-U-N-N-E-T-T, -T, the Punnett square. And what this is a tool for doing is for predicting offspring genotypes. And it only is done pretty much if you know the genotypes of the parents already. So this is an example here where I'm going to cross these two individuals. They're two heterozygote individuals, A1A2 by A1A2, right? And, and so what I want to know is what are the likelihoods of getting the different possible genotypes are? What are those genotypes? And which ones are more common or are they all the same amount of commonness? So we're going to do a simple dominance example, which is pretty common for this. So I call this the simple dominant. And that means I'm going back to my red pen. Let's say that A1 is dominant and it has a curved thumb and A2 is recessive and it's straight thumb. Okay, and I, I might have switched these from the last example, but um, we're going to go with it this way anyway. Um, so, you know, we have this particular genotype, which is curved. This genotype, the heterozygote, is curved because A1 is dominant. And then you have A2A2, which is a straight thumb. It's homozygous recessive. So the way you set it up is you put each of the parents on this square with the four squares in it, right? And so... You might imagine if this is the male, you could draw these as little sperm cells if you want, because there are two potential sperm cells for the male to donate, and they both occur at 50% each, right? Because they're dividing in metaphase one through independent assortment, they have an equal probability of being inherited in the gametes, which means that you can they're equal probabilities. And the same thing is happening on the female side. You can draw these like eggs if you want, and the female will give equal proportions of these. Now, the female has fewer eggs, um, that doesn't change the probability. In a male, you can think of 400 million sperm in a single ejaculation means that you would have probably, you know, 200 million A1s and 200 million A2 sperm in the same um, collection there. But so when we pair them up, then what we do is we bring this one down and this one over, and we can make each of the different possible combinations. So there's all the, each of these represents a combination. So when we're done with this, we can look and see which ones look like which, and we can see there's a homozygous dominant here, there's a homozygous recessive, and that these two in the middle are both heterozygotes. So this is a one to two to one ratio, if you want to look at it that way. You could also say that there's a, for A1, A1 has a 25% probability, or a quarter, right? A2, A2 has the same, and there's a 50% probability, because there's two different ways to get um, probability of getting um, A1, A2, or A2, A1, which would be the same. So this tells you um, the likelihood of each of these different genotypes. You could also look at the phenotypes and ask about those, which I sometimes do on the exams as well, and you got to recognize that the only unique phenotype here is this one, which is the homozygous recessive. You know, all the other ones are actually going to be, um, you know, the, all three of these guys here, these three are all um, the type phenotype A1, which is the curved thumb. So this one's straight, and all the rest of them are curved. So when you do Punnett squares, there's really only a limited number of ways they can combine, right? Um, I should mention what's partly in here is you could gather some insight into your parents by going back to look at their thumbs. Um, I guess you might want to look up to see exactly which one of these is really dominant. I don't recall offhand. Um, and then you could, you know, see if your thumbs match up with your parents' thumbs. Uh, keeping in mind that there's a few percentages of the time when actually thumb shape can change in development, so um, uh, there might be some variance from the, from the Punnett square probabilities. These are all the possible combinations. You can do a heterozygote with a heterozygote, a homozygote with a heterozygote, a homozygote with a homozygote, or the other heterozygote, the heterozygote with the other um, homozygous one. So one could be a homozygous dominant and the other homozygous recessive. So there's really only these four combinations. Um, and so you can kind of practice these and, you know, 
Um, basically, this can tell you the answer to these kinds of questions here, right? Like given the two genotypes, what is the genotypic ratio of offspring? What is the probability of an offspring will be a particular genotype, like male or female, for example, or will it be of curved thumb or straight thumb? And in particular, you're interested for this, how it applies to genetic um, disorders, diseases, as they might get handed down. So in this particular case, uh, this is the way each of these works. This is A1A1 with A1A2, so a homozygous dominant with a heterozygous. And what we get is a one-to-one -one ratio in the genotypes, and we get a phenotypic ratio of um, pretty much they all look the same because they all have the dominant allele. So I'm going to slowly page across these. You can see I did these in class. Notice that the phenotype ratio is at the bottom and uh, the genotype ratio is at the top. And uh, I don't think I really need to go through and read these all to you. I have another video online you're happy to watch. Uh, you, you would be welcome to watch about how to do Punnett squares. Um, here on YouTube, and there's a link to that in this section as well. Um, but uh, these are the different potential outcomes. This is the one we already did first. Uh, probably an interesting one here is this is this one right here, which is kind of interesting because it involves um, two, there's only sort of two genotypes that come out of it. One is heterozygotes and one is homozygous recessive. So that's kind of interesting, I guess. All right. I wanted to talk briefly about why you might want to do this. Boomer Esiason was quarterback for the Cincinnati Bengals. I think he was quarterback anyway. And he has, uh, you know, what he discovered was that he is a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And what cystic fibrosis is, is a genetically inherited disease. And the way that it works is that um, I tried to draw a really ugly cell here. But imagine this is your phospholipid membrane. This is your phospholipids, right? They're all in this membrane. And along in this membrane, there are these channels that carry certain ions. In this case, they carry chloride ions, and they carry them from the inside to the outside or the outside to the inside, which turns out to be a pretty important job. And they're made by these alpha helices, which we've looked at in class, which is a long, sort of curly, like a stick thing. And if you get a mutation in the DNA, so you get a mistake in the DNA, which changes the messenger RNA, which then changes the protein sequence because you get a different amino acid in there than you had before, you might get a kink, right? As demonstrated by this kink shape here. And then there's a curve where there's not supposed to be and it goes off in the other direction. So instead of forming a, you know, a nice collection of, of sort of... of uh, of proteins, right, that previously made like an ion channel that would have been a place for this, these chloride ions to transport through. So it kind of looks like a long tube formed, right, where the ions can go down the middle. Uh, now one of them is bent and it closes the channel and it doesn't function. So what you would see then is that in a heterozygous individual, you would have, this channel is I represented as small c, wouldn't work. This one doesn't work. Um, this one doesn't work. Right? A bunch of them don't work. And that's okay when you're heterozygous, right? You have one good protein and one faulty protein. Some of your channels actually work because they're created by the gene that does work pretty well, the allele that does work pretty well. Um, in the event that you have um, all little Cs, right, so that they none of them work, what ends up happening here is that fibers build up in the epithelial tissues of the lungs and it's really bad for little kids because they just have to, basically the, the treatment is to beat them on the back to break up the fibers every morning. There are medications for this now. Kids can do okay, but, you know, as recently as 20 years ago, you know, they would die by 12 years old of suffocation. It was really bad. So it's a pretty common allele, too, like in, in, in descendants of, uh, of, uh, of Western European descent, it's about 1 in 10,000. So basically, Brewer Siasen might want to do a, a Punnett square to figure out the likelihood of his, he and his wife having a child that would be a, a little c, little c child. And so to do that, and they found out she was a carrier as well, right? And so they made this Punnett square here, and you can see that, you know, crossing Boomer with his wife, and they're like, oh, there's a one quarter chance. Um, and, you know, this is an important decision for them. They eventually, I think they did end up having kids, um, and they were able to have kids that didn't have cystic fibrosis, but this was a great challenge for them. And, um, but it's something you'd certainly want to know about if you were a, uh, um, um, 
you're going to have those, those, you know, children and you knew you were carrying this allele. Um, and so, you know, this is just, you know, I, I, I point this out that it's just this tiny little mistake in the DNA. One way we have looked at this is to use something called, um, you know, it wouldn't be great if we could change the genome, right? And, and one of the ways they think about that is to, if you could just go into that little area and you could change the genome, that would be pretty powerful. Um, and, and what you see on here is, is uh, some discussions we had in class about how that might be done. But uh, thanks for thinking about it. Thanks for thinking about Punnett squares. And this is the origin of a thing that we call genetic counseling, um, which is getting more and more important as we begin to learn more and more about the DNA that our offspring.